Welcome back to the Life Itself podcast and the third in a series of dialogues with Dr. Jeffrey Martin. Jeffrey is a founder of the transformative technology space and he's a serial entrepreneur, a social scientist who researches personal transformation and the state's of greatest human well-being. Uh, for over 15 years, Jeffrey has conducted the largest international study on consistent non-symbolic experience, which includes the types of consciousness commonly known as enlightenment, non-duality, the peace that passes understanding, unit of experience, and hundreds of other terms. This has resulted in the first reliable cross-cultural and pan-tradition classification system for these types of experiences. It has also led to the fundamental discovery that these were psychological states that had been identified and adopted for thousands of years by many cultures and belief systems. They are also not inherently necessarily spiritual or religious or limited to any given cultural population and could be molded in many ways to shape the experience. And more recently, he has used this research to make systems available to help people obtain profound psychological benefits in a rapid, secular, reliable and safe way. And we ended just for those of us joining or who may have missed it or need a reminder, we finished our last episode on the location map of the Martin matrix or this, this map of fundamental well-being, or even you could say a map of enlightenment, a map of uh, these kind of states. And so Jeffrey, I wonder if you could, you know, we, we'd already covered that map, but you were about to talk about depth. You know, you talked about locations and you're about to talk about depth. Do you want to, Tell us a bit about that. Absolutely. Thanks. It's great to be with you again. I very much appreciate this opportunity to speak with you and everyone today. So the original research that we did uncovered the matrix, which is a more or less two-dimensional map. Uh, and if you think about the x-axis, which would go you know, sort of from left to right, that is really the different types uh, of fundamental well-being, like the, the higher classification types. And those are not always in someone, right? And so those deal with uh, rewiring in the brain and things like that. However, there's also a depth or a y-axis. So you could think of that as going from sort of bottom up above each one of the uh, locations. And so each location has a range of depths. Now, there are many different locations, and there are actually more depths than we'll talk about today as well. But for the most part, the vast majority of people that will ever experience this will fall within a certain range. And so that's usually what we find it you know, most important to talk about. So today we'll talk about four depths, essentially. And um, that's, again, on the y-axis. And so if you really map that out, you think about there being four primary locations that someone might be in, uh, four different types of it, and then you have four different, um, essentially, layers of depth for each one of those, you start to realize that this is one of those things that there's a lot of different types of the experience of. And then it is actually more than that, because for each one of the layers of depth, you can be in that layer in a very shallow way or more of a mid-range way or more of a deep way. And so there's actually a range of experiences even within each one of these categories or types of depth. So there are a lot of different ways to experience fundamental well-being. And this is why it can be so confusing when someone is out there listening to YouTube or reading books or going to workshops or whatever else, and they're being exposed to all of these different ways that fundamental well-being is being expressed. And you might have teachers or systems or whatever saying, this is what it actually is, you know? Um, but they often don't agree with each other, even within their own tradition. As we talked about last time, I think they often don't agree with each other. And so this is the reason. It's because it's a really vast landscape when you start to look at it. And oftentimes what people are talking about when they're talking about progressing in fundamental well-being is a very small part of this overall matrix. So for instance, 
yesterday or last time we talked about not even, not yesterday actually we shot that a long time ago now right um but the last time we were together we talked about um location one being sort of the most shallow or simple or basic uh form of fundamental well-being uh, and then there's a location two and a three and a four. And most people will land into one of those. And uh, oftentimes they'll just sort of stick there. Uh, they might not, you know, progress or develop. It sort of depends on what's going on with them. There really aren't a lot of traditions that would consider location one a valid form of fundamental well-being. Location one is sort of like the poor stepchild of the matrix. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's just not like, you know, some sort of overwhelming type of experience. Most of the traditions would either associate location two or location three, or in some rare cases, location four, as, you know, kind of a valid spot from a continuum standpoint. And so when we're talking about a tradition discussing depth and discussing progression within its uh, own sort of, you know, rule sets and belief systems and dogma and stuff like that, what we're usually talking about is people progressing deeper into a location, not further along the locations. And that's a very important distinction that can help people to really sort of sort things out in their mind. So as we look through the different layers, layer one is we often associate it with mind, frankly, with thoughts, emotions. The layers are often what you are associated with. And so if you are really sort of rooted into layer one, you're typically rooted into a sense that you are much more your thoughts and emotions and things like that than not. Now, that may be a surprise to people who know about fundamental well-being and who have listened maybe to our prior conversations, because there's a big shift, of course, that happens from no fundamental well-being to fundamental well-being, even just at location one, with the sense of kind of a fundamental discontentment in the system, shifting to a sense that things are fundamentally okay, the quieting down oftentimes of the narrative mind to some degree, you know, negative emotions falling off more rapidly and things like that. However, one, if you're if you're still in location one, layer one, or frankly, even location two, layer two, uh, layer one, I'm sorry, location two, layer one, um, you can still be very identified with your mind, very identified with your thoughts and your emotions. You would still basically say, no, you know, that's more or less who and what I am. Very rarely do you run across a spiritual or religious tradition that says that that is a valid form of fundamental well-being, right? They're all working on getting people to realize, no, you're not your thoughts. No, you're not your emotions. You're not your mind, that type of thing. And so, you know, there are some places that are just sort of excluded from a lot of the religious and spiritual traditions that are out there. If you move up into layer two, Layer two starts sounding a lot more like what people have probably heard in, you know, YouTube videos from spiritual teachers or maybe their own spiritual or religious tradition or whatever else. And that is, it, it brings in a sense of spaciousness, a sense of emptiness, a sense of spacious emptiness for some, right? But you can really just have one or the other. There can just be a sense of increased spaciousness. There can be a sense of increased emptiness. Um, or there can be the two combined together, spacious and emptiness. It feels miraculous, frankly. All of a sudden, you just sort of realize, wow, everything is just here. It's all just sort of here on its own. Um, and there's a sense of the miraculous that's kind of arising with that. As you deepen into it, you really sort of get a sense, okay, this, all of this, everything that I'm looking at, it's really made of this you know, spacious emptiness type stuff. However that's showing up for you, I'll just use the combined word. Um, but again, it can just be the spaciousness or just the emptiness or whatever else, right? And that spacious emptiness is kind of containing everything and is everything. Everything is made of it. It's a rising of it. If you go deep enough into it, your own identity will shift and you'll have this aha moment that's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm not my thoughts and emotions. 
I'm the spaciousness or I'm the emptiness or I'm the spacious emptiness. And it will feel like that is your identity. That is who and what you are, who and what you are made of and all of that. As you continue to deepen in through the layers, the next thing that begins to happen basically on the cusp more or less between layer two and layer three is the emptiness starts to have a fullness that comes in. And so if this is the emptiness, you start to perceive a fullness basically coming in. And this is where, you know, if you've been in the spiritual or religious space for any length of time, especially on the Eastern side of things, you've no doubt heard people talk about, you know, the emptiness and the fullness uh, and how the emptiness is fullness and the fullness is emptiness and whatever. So that is basically that point of, one can think of it as sort of that point of development through the layers of depth. On the other side of that, you have the fullness coming more to the foreground. And that's layer three. And layer three has many different ways that it can be experienced. Just as we talked about location two being sort of the broadest range of experience uh, and the many different ways that location two can show up and some of the other locations having much more narrow ranges of experience, locate, layer three is really the broadest layer in terms of different types of experiences. And so as one comes into layer three, you generally, you know, will start to perceive a fullness, um, but not everyone will perceive it that way. Some people will just perceive that there is something all pervasive, literally all pervasive, right? Now this may start off as just a little sense um, and in fact, almost all of the layers, layer two, layer three, layer four, uh, they almost always start off as kind of a sense. It's like you can sort of tell that some property or quality of it is there, but you're not really directly perceiving it more fully yet. And then, you know, putting attention on that kind of pulls you over time into a more full experience of that. Doing that pulls you more into uh, having an identity shift into it. So there's this kind of progression that goes along with each one of these layers. So as you go into layer three, layer three can feel a lot of different ways initially to people as they're beginning to sense into it. They might sense that there's something that's all pervasive. They might sense a fullness. Um, you know, they might be in uh, layer two as an example and start to get a sense of a fullness in the emptiness or something like that. Not one that's really being strongly perceived or anything yet, but just a sense of it, just like a hint of it, a hint that something in that direction might be there. Uh, it might be a range of emotions, like um, an, an amazing sort of joy or love or a combination of joy and love and uh, even compassion or um, you know gratitude uh, can sneak its way in there, all sorts of things like that. So, so it's sort of a tight bundle of um, these types of more positive feelings and emotions. Um, and that relates, you know, if you remember from, if you watched the previous video on this series, uh, that sounds a lot like location three, location three has that dominant, uh, meta emotion, if you will, that is a combination of love and joy and compassion. That same meta emotion combination can occur in layer three of location two, the difference between the two is that in location two, you still have personal emotions that are being experienced. That meta emotion is not going to be a personal emotion. It's going to be impersonal. You might feel it as divine or the panpsychic thing that we talked about last time or whatever. Um, but nonetheless, in location two, layer three, um, when you're experiencing that, you can also still have the experience of personal emotions, and you don't have that in location three. Um, and so as you move into location three, you are, look, I'm sorry, layer three, you eventually get to um, deeper and deeper and deeper into it, 
right? Uh, so you get to a place where there is, it does feel like there's sort of an all-pervasive field or an all-pervasive presence that can have that very positive emotional and feeling component, or it can have none of that. It can be emotionless. It can be flat for other people. That's not sort of a guaranteed part of the experience for people. And you can tell sort of your system's default directionality from what is showing up regarding those emotional or feeling expressions. If you're getting that love and joy, or it can just be one of those. It can just be the love. It can just be the joy, right? Or it can be a combination. That's, your system is probably more inclined to go to location three next. If you are not getting anything, if you have a more flat experience, a more emotionally neutral uh, type of experience or whatever, your system is probably more inclined to go up to layer four next. And you can bias this by what you're putting your attention on. So if you're in layer three and, you know, sometimes you get a glimpse of a little love, but it's generally flat, or sometimes you get a glimpse of, you know, sort of some emotional flatness, but usually there's a lot of, you know, joy or something, and you want to bias the experience one way or the other, you want to put your attention on what it is that you want to grow and expand. Um, and that will help you to go sort of one way uh, or the other. If I can um, just, and so in, in, go ahead. Do you have a question? One second. If I can, maybe I'm just going to try and share, um, temporarily, uh, my, uh, my, my, just to, to kind of give a map of it. Um, what, just as I understand, this would be like something we've kind of got these, these layers here and we've got these locations very crudely. I don't know if you can see that so just to, like a lot of people are visualizing this and there's like just to recap there's an x-axis or kind of if you're thinking of a graph with locations and then there's these kind of layers which I've, I've given these labels i don't know if you still use them but it's kind of like my like layer one layer two layer three layer four and what i'm trying to draw just also is what you're saying there's some degree of connection sometimes between the layer uh you know like layer three has a kind of affinity with location three but it's not absolute. I mean, I, I don't know if that was one point you were getting at, but the point is that the, any of these layers is available in any of the locations. Is that, would that be a fair, like, but it's, it's harder. It's easier. Like there's a kind of defaultness to the layer and the location association in that matrix or, or, or not. You know, to some degree, um, if you want, I can see if I have on my system here, cause I'm in the studio. We have a so we do a yeah. Shooting. And we have a lot of, uh, I can probably find a graphic. That's better, yeah. But, but just to recap that with the people are listening, just if they're imagining it from the podcast, you know, there's these locations and we talked about it as like this geographical map. You can sometimes say, I'm, I know I'm going from London to, you know, Istanbul. I go through different countries on that journey. But there's also like, you could kind of fly at different altitudes, you know, in, in, in those locations um, if they're trying to get it. Okay, great, yeah. Sure. So here's the what here's a simple way to visualize it. You have the locations across the bottom, and you can see the gradient shading of the gray, you know, to darker, right? To note that it's it is a gradient. Um, and these are deeper, further types. And then you have the layers above them, which denotes the depth. Um, you know, this is a more discrete way of viewing it. And so for each one of these, these are in essence each a separate experience. Um, and, you know, this is sort of zooming out more deeply into fundamental well-being versus zooming in more into sort of a more tightly constrained, less fundamental well-being like more humanish sort of like thing. This also relates to stillness. Right. So the more still your interior experiences, which really more than less comes from stealing the mind, frankly, uh, and the degree of stillness in the mind. Um, the ten, generally speaking, the deeper you are. And in fact, stillness is kind of the super highway through some of this. Stillness can take you pretty far into the upper reaches of layer three, uh, which is nice. Uh, that just focusing on the, just focusing on stillness, just putting your attention on stillness and letting stillness build and grow and whatever else, it's kind of like a meta hack or a meta technique that will pull you up through uh, to the highest, deepest parts of layer three, it generally won't pull you over to layer four 
for um, actually kind of some complicated <laughs> reasons that we probably, you know, don't want to take time for uh, here today. Uh, let me see if uh, what else we might have here. So here's another way of thinking about this, right? Uh, each one of these can be viewed as sort of its own discrete experience. You have all of these different types of fundamental well-being. And I'll tell you one other thing that, um, let's see if I can find it here, in terms of how these relate to each other, right? So people are, again, we have the locations and the layers. Um, people are uh, more or less able to access these. So they're not really all accessible in an easy way, regardless of where you're at location-wise, right? So more people land by far in location one into layer one than anywhere else. And it's actually really, really hard for someone to stay in location one and reach layer three or reach layer four. These are, all, these are generally gonna be temporary experiences of a very shallow experience of those layers. The one exception is if someone has been very far out in the continuum and they've come back to an earlier place, you know, their system can be in location one. So for instance, they might've gotten ill, right? Someone might've gone way, way out into say location four. And uh, they might have been in location four for a long time, and then they got sick, right? Uh, and their system, oftentimes, when you get really, really ill, will pull you back down to location one. It like It's like it wants you in location one to heal the body, oftentimes. This is very puzzling for these people, because they, if they're a spiritual teacher or religious leader, they've probably spent a lot of time telling others that this can't happen right? That you can't go back like this uh, to an earlier place or whatever. And so, you know, it's led to a lot of co great conversations over the years with people that were very puzzled by this, generally not admitting it publicly, because um, it would go against a lot of what they said, you know, and the beliefs that they were putting out there and stuff, right? Um, but that's an example of how someone could come back and experience a more full version of layer four in location one. But it's generally not going to happen when you're just starting out and on your way there. It's like, it's going to happen if you're, you know, on your your way back, you've been way out and you're coming back. So location two has a couple of different default locations. If someone generally just jumps and just transitions from normal consciousness right into location two, ordinarily they're going to do that at layer one. If someone is transitions, has their initial transition into location one, then and they jump to location two as just part of a fundamental well-being change in their experience then in all likelihood, they're going to go to layer two in location two. And so we say it has these two different default things. Layer three is highly accessible in location two. Layer four is difficult to reach. And it's, again, often temporary. It's very difficult to get a full expression of it. It does happen very, very rarely. Someone will really sort of lock in a full, more full expression of layer four in location two. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, traditions out there, especially Eastern traditions that are really trying to do that. Uh, and so you do see it occasionally, but it's really, really rare. Ordinarily, what happens is instead of going from layer three to layer four, people will jump bit pulled over to location four I got instead you. of, yeah. Could you just illustrate, because it's like in the abstract, like it, what would location two, just remind people, like you said, oh, there might be some <laughs> tradition, can you just illustrate what it would like someone's experience would be like in location two, but layer four or so like just, or you said there are some traditions that, that, that pull towards that. Yeah. Can you put a bit of flesh on the bones? Just, just, I know it's one of sure. many to come here, but it just makes it kind of, why is the matrix actually so, so relevant? Cause also not only for your own self, but when you're seeing stuff out there in the world and people talking, uh, you just said on YouTube, whatever, it really helps understand that. Yeah. And these are, these are exactly, they're not literal. They're just things, but I just think it would give a taster. You know, it's, this is more even metaphor or, or like we were writing a novel or uh, giving people a, a, you know, just an idea pointers. Yeah. Right. And we didn't, we haven't talked about layer four yet. Um, you know, we, we stopped off at layer three and we actually didn't fully finish um, layer three just to round out layer three. Uh, essentially, when you when you are in the deepest part of layer three, uh, it starts. There's that field, that sense of sort of an all pervasive presence or all pervasive field, 
for most of layer three, it still feels like it has a center to it. And that's a little difficult to explain if you haven't experienced it. We don't want to spend an hour doing that today. Um, but you know, just take that as a recognition if you happen to ever make it there, you know, if you're listening to it and you happen to ever make it there. Um, as you deepen into layer three, that falls away, that center falls away, and you're just left with a centerless field or a centerless sort of all pervasive presence. And then the final sort of deepening step in, um, locate, in layer three um, is basically a new or enhanced, a deeper type of stillness. And that's really where the mind has really been sort of maximally quieted as much as it can be quieted um, in, the, uh, in those first layers of experience. And then you have a transition to uh, layer four. And so let's use these slides to talk about layer four. And, the, and it's because layer four is very hard uh, to talk about it, right? It's basically, it's another massive shift. Um, and the progression might look something like this, starting at layer one, you know, I'm my mind, I'm my thoughts, I'm my emotions, you know, oh, oh, wait a minute, you know, the transition to layer two, no, 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 wait, I'm not my mind, I'm the all containing spaciousness. Right, right, that's what I, oh, no, 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 wait, no, no, I'm the all pervasive field or the all pervasive presence or the all pervasive fullness. Uh, or whatever else. And it does not feel like there is any chance that that could ever go away when you're experiencing that in layer. It feels like the most foundational reality that could ever possibly exist until it disappears. Uh, and so the primary change going into layer four can best be expressed as a loss of all containers, a loss of all separation. Even though prior layers, you wouldn't necessarily say that there is separation there. It's just because you're not perceiving it. And so, for instance, saying I am, I am that, or even just I am, that's actually a separation. There's an I that is reflecting on something else, right? There's a reflecting on process that's happening there in consciousness, in awareness. It can be very subtle. Everybody misses it right? But it's there. And once you transition over into layer four, it's kind of a different ballgame. And so it's really sort of like is, is a separation. If you're saying this is, or that is, again, there's a separation there. There's something being compared, something being reflected on in some way. And that doesn't exist in layer four. In layer four, the best you can say is maybe just is itself, right? Or there is just this. And it really can't be thought of or described or anything in any way that extends beyond that. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to explain. So, for instance, in layer three, there's sort of this all-pervasive fullness and field, and it, people describe it in some ways like the clear light of awareness or beingness, the ground of all being. Some people get the love version of it. All of those go. There is neither being nor not being. Right. And so it's not so the people who are like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's there's a not beingness. Nope, that's not layer four. Right. If there's a sense of beingness or a sense of not beingness, you haven't made it into layer four. Yeah. It's really just sort of everything in your system dies to just this. And that can sound very mystical. Right. It can sound like, oh, God, they must be experiencing just like the quantum foam. I wonder how they even function in reality. But it's nothing like that. This is just this room. It's just literally what is here. You know, what is being perceived? There isn't an assumption that there's anything even beyond the room or anything. It's just this. Uh, and it's as mundane as could possibly be imagined. People often describe it as a cosmic joke. You know, that they spend all this time trying to get to this place and the laugh is on them, you know, because all they're left with is basically the most mundane reality imaginable. But in that mundane reality is, you know, such a more spectacular and free way to live, because what you're basically doing over the course of prior layers is you're, you're working your way out of one distorted layer of perception after another, after another, after another, after another, right? So there's all these mind-based layers of perception that are just increasingly 
going. So there's literally nothing else except pure existence. And again, that's like, oh, that's the quantum foam. I can't even imagine what they're experiencing, right? But it's not. It's just ordinary. What's in this room? What's being, you know, literally perceived? It's not a big deal. Um, so it knows itself. There's nothing reflecting on the, the you know, what is here. Right. So it's basically self revealing in a way, self knowing. Again, that sounds like some mystical, woo, magical thing. It's not. It is a mundane expression in language trying to convey what it's actually like. Obviously, if there's no focal point reflecting on something else and everything is just here, the only thing that can be the case is that it's somehow self revealing to itself. Right. Okay, so you get the idea here. I'll go through uh, some of these other things. It's basically beyond all opposites, right? So it's not subject or object. They're both, these are all irrelevant. Everything, every bullet point on this page is irrelevant, even non dual and dual, right? There isn't dual, there isn't non dual. That's just irrelevant in terms of a way of looking at things, which, you know, for spiritual seekers, and stuff. Uh, that's probably a big surprise. Um, okay, so like I said, it's often perceived as sort of all containers falling away. If we go and we look at the progression of these things, right, coming out of and through the layers, you basically have, you know, you're coming from being completely embedded in thoughts and emotions, and you are absolutely your thoughts and emotions in a very neurotic way, pre-fundamental well-being and all of that, right? To generally speaking, let's say you land in location one, layer one, or something like that, um, you're still associated with your mind, with your thoughts and your emotions, but it's in a you know far more peaceful, far more fundamentally okay um, kind of way. And then you start to get some meta awareness of thoughts and emotions. You start to get distance from thoughts and emotions. You start getting the sense: wait a minute, maybe I am not my thoughts and emotions, and Along with that, after that, you start to get a sense or an awareness of an all-containing spaciousness or emptiness or spacious emptiness or whatever. The terms that we're using on this slide are more or less the most complete uh, terms or expressions of the experience. And then, you know, you keep putting your attention on that. Or you keep sinking into stillness or whatever, right? And you get to a direct experience of the spacious emptiness. It's no longer like, oh, I think something is there. I can just almost sense it. You know, it's like it's right here. Just you can almost fall back into it or something, you know, but it's a mystery still. You're not sure what it is. You just get a very little sense of what it might be. So all of a sudden you're directly experiencing it, right? And then you're it. You're associated with it. Your identity shifts to it. Um, and so you've got um, stillness and whatnot infused with the container and a deeper stillness pervading um, and co-varying with the spacious emptiness. Uh, and then you start to sense an all-pervasive fullness or field co-varying <laughs> with the emptiness. Uh, and then you have an association, you know, you, then you start to, there's one missing here to make the slide shorter. There's a direct experience of the all-pervasive uh, fullness and field, then there's the association or the I am, oh my God, I got it all wrong. I'm not the spacious emptiness, I'm the fullness, right? Uh, and you deepen into that basically until you hit the centerless spot. Um, and then that last deep sense of it. And then there's a sense or awareness of a layer of pure existence. That's the deepest silence and stillness within awareness, right? So itself, that, this, you really can't even add a second word to any of these words. And then, of course, uh, there's a middle one here, again, eliminated for the slide to make it shorter, but there's a, you know, starting to sense it, they're starting to directly experience it, then there's a transition into associating with it, being identified with it, and then uh, you can deepen into it. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's more layers than the four, but it's extremely rare for someone to make it there. And so I think that maybe will help people to sort of visualize this type of thing. And there are there are common paths through it. You know, so the least friction path through it would be to land in location one, layer one, work your way up to layer two, get pulled over to layer two, look to location two at layer two, you know, maybe start working your way up to layer three, get pulled over to location three at layer three, which is the default spot 
for location three, start working on getting up to layer four, get pulled over to location four, because layer four is the default for location four and so on. So there, so there are sort of these frictionless flows through this thing. Most traditions don't use those flows because they're often stuck in a, like Christianity, it's location three or bust. You know, I mean, that's what it's about for them. Uh, they want that sense of union. They want that sense of, you know, dissolving into that. And so they will get to glimpses of location four, of layer four sometimes, uh, staying in layer three. And, and they'll use terms like the Godhead for it uh, and stuff like that. But again, it's normally temporary glimpses. Every now and then you have somebody that, you know, sort of falls off the end of the Christian mystical tradition, like we talked about last time with Bernadette Roberts, I think. Um, into location four and then spent, you know, she spent like 30 years or more trying to contextualize what the heck happened there and how she could still be Catholic, um, you know, and how there was still God and the Trinity and what all that meant in the confines of a location four type experience, which is not an easy, not an easy way to sort of contort uh, Christian dogma. Um, so you get the idea. Yeah, just an example there. That's a really good example. I, I actually, you didn't, I think, mention Bernadette Roberts in, in this series. So maybe in a way we could say, but this is an example where you, you came across someone or this person themselves, having this context could be very helpful because you're saying that there'd actually be this challenge when you don't have the map. You're like, oh, what happened? You know, I, I'm, um, so you're saying in her case, you know, she kind of continued and then was like, whoa, this is not fitting the, the previous example, but um I wanted to ask, I wanted to come maybe that would otherwise take us to feel we might put that on the shelf and, and come back to that question. I suppose one of my questions I like I personally have is how do you how compatible is development in these ways with kind of conventional life? Um, you know, what what I'm just gonna speak maybe from my own personal experience is that at some moments I felt um you know, even let's say recently, I might be like, oh, having a sense of deepening in either in layer or maybe in a, and then like, oh, I have some kind of work event, like some, you know, I'm, I'm an, partly an entrepreneur, right? And, you know, it's like, oh, I now have to deal with this kind of issue, or there's some urgency of some kind, or it appears mm -hmm. like that. And even if like, mm -hmm. often I feel at like the beginning, I may feel very kind of zen, if I put it that way, like at the beginning, it's like, oh, you know, I can go you know kind of all the stuff is just sort of arising and i need to go deal with that but often somehow I, I have this metaphor of like paint mixing that somehow there's this dye or, or coloring of the event you know or other people's emotion and that i often even underestimate often in in a certain state how much that will affect me and kind of pull me if you like more into my mind mm -hmm. i mean i'm always mm -hmm. let me clear mine's always there but it's somehow the degree to which you're sort of identifying or it's shaping my attention or my experience. Um, mm -hmm. And I just kind of, I'm intrigued, even from your own work, what you saw of people who move through the, the can kind of the, the, the continuum and like what jobs do they do? You know, do, do you know anyone in like location four, who's like, uh, like a very active entrepreneur, you know, like, I mean, to say one other person I've talked quite a lot with from, who's done the finest course you know i used to talk with he was quite an entrepreneur he's just like well it kind of just fell away because you know i lost interest in you know he's now like he says in location but he's like i kind of just lost interest in you know running the business you know i was okay but you know because i i'd been successful but i wasn't i just wasn't really motivated to play what he kind of said it was almost a bit like monopoly like it kind of becomes this you didn't really see the point of it so i just wondering mm -hmm. you know how how do you see that, like with people, you know, yeah, no, normal life, quote unquote, you know, a job, a family, how do those things kind of, are they compatible? What kind of, what kind of jobs have you seen people in location four or location three or location two do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great question. And what we tell people is that these different ways of experiencing fundamental well-being definitely need to be matched up to specific lifestyles. You know, this isn't a situation where uh, a, a spiritual organization, for instance, might say to people, look, it's pedal to the metal, you know, it's go as far and as fast as you possibly can, you know, 
and get just as deep as you possibly can or whatever else. It was very obvious, these, these sort of tendencies right from the beginning of the research with people who are experiencing fundamental well-being. We sat down with a lot of people and we were in their living rooms and we were in their lives and they were telling us about their lives. And you can't spend hours over the course of a day with someone and not learn about what's going on in their life or how it's changed in their life over the years and all of that. Uh, and it became very clear to us um, that in some sense, fundamental well-being needs to be, you know, contextualized for people in terms of what it's good for, right? That it's, it's, it's not your entire life, it's a part of your life, just like other things are. Work is probably a part of your life. Family is a part of your life. Fundamental well-being is a part of your life. And you need to make decisions around each one of those things, just like you might make a decision not to be a workaholic or to be a workaholic, right? Or to spend X amount of time in a certain way with various members of family or friends or doing hobbies or whatever else. You need to be as thoughtful about how you're bringing in and incorporating fundamental well-being into your life. Uh, so from an entrepreneur standpoint, uh, we think probably, you know, location one is great, obviously, for that. Um, location one is light enough, generally speaking, from a fundamental well-being standpoint, that it's fine for anything, you know. Um, and a lot of people are very happy just remaining in fundamental well-being in location one uh, and do for decades, you know. Um, location two, we think is kind of a sweet spot in terms of a mix between well-being and operating in the world and at a larger scale or a more, shall we say, responsible scale or whatever. Uh, you know, I come from obviously a business background and entrepreneurship uh, type of background, business building type of background. And so I like to think of it as a place where you can still safely be entrusted with PL responsibility, right? <laughs> which is like profit and loss statement. It basically means, you know, you have responsibility probably for some revenues and expenditures and you have a, you have a chunk of a company basically that you're responsible for the finances of and for stewarding that, you know, having good stewardship around that and whatever else. That location too, we don't see that as generally being a problem unless someone goes really, really deep into it. Um, then potentially there can be some issues with that. What often happens is people will match professions uh, up. And so, for instance, it's very, very common for therapists, for people to become therapists that are in fundamental well-being. You know, you can be a perfectly fine therapist in location four or even later, uh, or location three, right? In location three, probably PNL responsibility could be a bit problematic for you because you just love, you know, and you're so generous and giving and whatever else. And obviously if there's a certain budget, um, you have to be, you know, able to sometimes toe a very hard no kind of line. Um, that is the opposite of what would be generosity and another circumstance, right? Or looked at from another perspective. And so um, location three, probably not ideal for those types of things, right? But there are many professions that are, you know, as, as someone who builds businesses, right? Traditionally in my life, um, I tend to think of everything from the perspective of investment and entrepreneurship um, and stuff like that, right? And so I don't have, I haven't traditionally had, I've kind of had to build this up through the research. Uh, I haven't even really had normal jobs per se, you know, like when I was in high school and I mean, in grade school, I was like a hacker and, uh, you know, I was like getting in trouble, breaking into things, you know, at 13 or whatever. And I kind of came up with a whole piece of the software industry kind of pretty young, um, and so I've just been kind of an entrepreneur having my own businesses. The closest I came to having a job was when I, uh, at one point my parents took away my computer and my mom was a Christian TV show host. And the only other computer that I knew of with a modem was in her studio. And so I basically pretended to be interested in going to the studio forever for the first time ever, you know, with her. Um, and I kind of got hooked on the TV technology stuff because I, I just like technology, right? 
Um, and so I wound up learning all the TV jobs and then everybody at that studio, like went on strike or quit in protest of something or something like that. And it was like me and the guy who ran the place were the only two people left that knew how the stuff worked. Uh, and so, you know, he's like, Hey, you know, after school, would you mind, you know, we'll like pay you under the table, you know, would you mind coming down? You can't leave, you're not old enough to work yet. Right. Uh, legally in America. Uh, and then they got an exemption from the mayor. So he could legally pay me when I finally got old enough for that. And then finally I was old enough to work and whatever else. Right. And so I love that TV technology type stuff. That was probably as close as I came to, a, to having a job was at various points in television, but I would have done all that for free. You know, it was just a blast. I could care less that I was getting paid for it. Uh, and so I've never really like worked at a restaurant or, you know, had what somebody would consider a normal job that I couldn't just walk away from um or whatever else so that has really made it in, in a way from a research standpoint a little bit difficult for me to put myself in other people's shoes uh and to see okay it took me a while to realize oh i see there are these patterns of careers that people are choosing um and you know there's lots of therapists and stuff like that but there's people who also stay in their company especially if they're in a big company and they can kind of you know maneuver themselves into some sort of position that is safe for them and fits the characteristics of whatever form of fundamental well-being they're in sometimes you do run across um you know i can't say who it is but uh there's somebody who built a really significant groundbreaking company and this person was uh, had spent a lot of their time in location four working for other companies. Um, but primarily during that phase, they were in location three. And so what what happened is they used location three to be kind of a genius problem solver. And they described that period of their life as some of the world's largest, most sophisticated companies when they would have these intractable problems would hire this person to come in and basically solve them. And it would sometimes take a year or more, um, sometimes less, you know, but this person would more or less just do the impossible. You know, there's like a handful of people out there. It's known you give them a ton of money and they can do the impossible for you, right? It was one of those people. Uh, and he would describe his work day as getting up, <clears throat> having a bowl of cereal or something in the morning, right? Driving into work, uh, and spending the entire day taking the coarsest sandpaper that could possibly be found and rubbing it as hard as he could on his face for like 16 straight hours. And then putting the sandpaper down at the end of the day, going home, maybe having another bowl of cereal or something else to eat, going to sleep, waking up, doing it all over again the next day. Just day after day after day until that problem was solved. That's how painful he described that problem-solving process and how difficult it was, right? In location three, though, that's no problem, right? There isn't suffering, really, that you're going to experience from jamming that, you know, coarse sandpaper on your face for 16 hours a day. And so it's what allowed him to be sort of this magical being in these companies' worlds that could come in and do the impossible. Uh, eventually, of course, what happens if you're somebody like that is, um, you know, venture capital firms and uh, investors and stuff look at you and they're like, gosh, I wonder what that guy would do if we just gave him a bunch of money and said, you know, go solve some problem that'll make us a lot of money. Uh, and so he did that and he went into entrepreneurship and he started what has become a, a, a company that has been revolutionary. Uh, just a truly revolutionary company, the kind of company that touches all of our lives and extends what's possible for humanity. Again, I can't I have to stay anonymous here, um, but just, you know, if you can imagine taking someone who's that level of problem solving and be like, go solve anything you want, what they would choose and what the impact of that would be for all of us, it's huge. Uh, and so, but now he finds himself in a different role, right? And so what's he do? He hire, he tries to hire a bunch of people like him. He has this hiring process where he's trying to find problem solvers that are in location three. He's familiar with our work, it turns out. Um, but none of them have the combination of his level of genius and that um, you know, location three type of nature. And so, and he, in the meantime, has gone to location four uh, because he's realizing he has a different role now and he needs to be a different person. And his best guess is maybe location four is where I do that from. And he kind of got stuck in location four, which is how I found out about him. I was at this 
I can't probably, I probably shouldn't say where I was because that could maybe give away where he was. Uh, but anyway, he comes up to me and he's like, you know, hey, this is where I'm at. I really need, I feel like I really need to get back to location three because my team isn't going to solve this problem. I'm going to have to solve this problem. He brought on someone else uh, to run the company by that point. Um, and so, you know, I, this is a great example of how I think finders basically find their place. And sometimes it's floating around a little bit. Sometimes it's struggling around a little bit. Uh, he eventually made it back to location three, solved the problem, changed all of our lives. Um, you know, all, and uh, that is only going to increase like what he's done for all of us. It's just going to, the effects of that are going to amplify over the coming decades or century in a way that we can't even imagine. Um, and so, you know, people basically have to match fundamental well-being to their home life, to their work life, to their other responsibilities, things like that. Does that make I sense? Had a, yeah, I had a question there, which is also, do, don't things, I guess also a question I personally had, maybe other people would have is, let's pick this person or, or even myself, but are there things that will pull them out? So also the converse question, not just like you want to choose to match because you could be in a fundamental well-being or in a state that doesn't make you so functional, but also conversely, let's say you know let's say you've just moved over in a fundamental well-being even right but then you're in a really stressful job is there not like a chance that could kind of pull you out or like keep you pretty low you know like deep down there's a sense everything's okay but like each of my days is rubbing sandpaper on my face you know like I, I'm, 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 hopefully people like their work more than that but yeah and yeah, he but, did enjoy that actually but yeah 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 but i'm just like there's this aspect which is you know, are, are, are there also aspects where, hey, not only maybe you're not so functional, but it also affects limits to to where you go. I mean, to maybe to pick another example, Lester Levinson, who you, you, you bring up quite a bit in the course, people may be listening, be familiar with or could kind of Google, but, you know, this guy was a kind of entrepreneur in the 1930s, 1940s, has this moment, you know, where he's told he's, you know, he's got this heart attack, he's going to die, he has to go home. And that he really starts to deepen into fundamental well-being and then like really deepen, but because he has a lot of time off, right? You know, my other question is that aspect, which is, are there are there also things, maybe you do want to fund, maybe you want to move to location two, but does that require like, hey, if you start out in location one, you know, level layer one, and most of the time you're quite stressed or there's, or you're in, or you're in, or in a family where you're constantly having conflict with your spouse, is that going to not, you know, are, are those kind of circumstances going to hold you, not, I want to say hold you back, pull you back maybe to some extent? I think the answer to that mostly depends on how you get into fundamental well-being in the first place, frankly. Uh, certainly nothing pulls someone out more than stress. Uh, if I had one tip for someone to do after they've transitioned to fundamental well-being, it's under no circumstances to get in a new romantic relationship. Um, because those turn out to be, have some very, people have lots of conditioning. There's lots of stress in the system around those types of things. Um, really not a good idea. You're probably going to get pulled out of fundamental well-being if you've just transitioned and you start a new romantic relationship. You know, give yourself some time to deepen in, let that stabilize and so on. Um, and so there are things like that that are just sort of practical tips. The one of the things that we accidentally sort of stumbled upon, it wasn't an intentional thing on our part, um, is the importance of having the way you transition to fundamental well-being happen integrated into your life, right? And so what often happens is people will go away to retreats and then they'll come back to their normal life. And, you know, any gains that they may have made on the retreat, it's like it's happening in its own isolated bubble. And even oftentimes by the time someone is back at the airport, you know, they're feeling like they're all stressed and whatever Open returning phone, you know looking at the messages yeah exactly and that's you know that's not a a joke that's actual uh research um you know that's been done on the people back at the airport right um after retreats and things like that and so um it, it turns out we sort of accidentally protocol wise didn't do people in person. We did onesie twosie people in person early on in developing uh, the, you know, the protocol to do the AB research and stuff, uh, the before and after research. But when we rolled that out to even the first group, we did it all online. And the result of that was that it was embedded in people's lives. They were doing it 
in their normal environment with their normal stressors and all of that. And that wasn't, I'd love to say, you know, oh, we had this, you know, graduate student who had this brilliant insight and, you know, but it wasn't, it was just a total fluke. It was just the way we chose to deliver it. We knew we were looking for a way to deliver it in a consistent way that would always be the same from cohort to cohort for experimental reasons, you know, and to do that, you do it on video and you don't have people in person with you so that you can't bias them in different ways accidentally one time versus another time or whatever else, right? So we basically just did it for consistency of validity from an experimental environment type standpoint, but it turned out to be one of the most important keys to the whole thing and to having the fundamental well-being really stick for people after they use the protocol because they they're doing these practices embedded in their normal life so if they transition if it works for them it's working for them in their normal life and in their normal environment um and you know the there isn't some extra some isolated bubble of magic somewhere that they go into and come back out of and then get hit by the tidal wave of their normal life as a result of that so can work stresses you know still pull people out can yeah you've got to respect this you know there's a lot of uh, teachers and stuff out there that will say things like you know once you have it you can never lose it uh at the same time, I think those teachers would agree that people have temporary experiences of it, right? And so what they do in their mind is they separate the two. Oh, the temporary experiences are not the real thing, right? But once you have the real thing, you can never lose it. The temporary experiences could very well be the real thing. It's just people are getting pulled out of them by something, right? Uh, and so we have a very different view of all of that. And we really think that you have to really respect this. Uh, you have to, you know, very thoughtfully incorporate it into your life. If this is something that you want, you've got to give it a certain degree of priority. I mean, if you want to learn to do some sport, uh, you've got to give that sport some degree of attention and some degree of priority in your life if you're ever going to get good at it, right? It's the same with this, basically. So you might have a transition. You might go through a protocol like ours, and you might have a transition that is so powerful and so overwhelming and so deep that it's unlikely anything is ever going to shake you out of it. Um, realistically, you probably don't want that degree of experience because that type of experience is if it's a very very deep powerful earth-shattering transition into fundamental well-being there's probably going to be some dysfunction in your life as a result of it it's probably taken you and thrown you so deeply in that you're going to need to you know it's the Eckhart Tolle story about sitting on a park bench outside the Cambridge library or whatever uh for two three years or whatever it was you know trying to just sort of figure out what happened and return to some degree of functionality, right? Uh, so you don't want that kind of transition type of experience. You want a more gentle experience where you're shifted into it. But as a result of that, it can you can get shaken out of it if you're not respecting it, if you're not prioritizing it, if you're not continuing to sink into it and so on. And so that's why protocol wise for us, it's not just about getting people there, but then it's about how to make sure that they are you know, placing the degree of importance on it to keep them there. Well, otherwise, we would have to transition them all like Eckhart Tolle style or whatever, right? And we don't want to, we, we, we wouldn't do that ethically. We wouldn't just create a bunch of people who would have to go sit on park benches for years. That would obviously not be a nice thing to do for people, even though they would be in fundamental well-being if it messes up the rest of their life, you know? So can I, can I, that's can the I, way to think about it. Yeah, because I think <laughs> what's awesome is because I think that's so... But it brings me to a really um, central question about that of like context or setting, which I think shows up in many um, transformational, you know, practices, which is the kind of, I often call the self-discipline question. You know, there's, there's often this kind of meta question, you know, of like, why, why do some people get up every day and go to the gym and some people don't? Uh, or it, it's here like this key point which is if you want to have a gender then your circumstances matter and setting set your your kind of set and setting to support you ongoingly is crucial like many many people know that maybe doing a lot of meditation or or exercise or whatever we want to put or getting up every day to become a novelist or 
to develop any skill requires this kind of dedication, yet the evidence that I, I have seen in my own self, but I've also seen a lot in others, is that's often difficult, even with like dramatic benefits of, of it. Um, and that in a way, if you like, the, if, if the mind is often what's running, the body mind is just a kind of running thing. And it's kind of like this habit, you know, it, it's, it's basically, you know, like a kind of behavioral, you know, X happens, then you do Y and you've built up these habit loops over kind of your childhood or even our genetic history. And they're, they're, for example, not super wired to do things with high long-term payoffs, but short-term costs. Um, you know, I mean, let, let us just say in my case, I know that if I get up every day by 6 a.m. and I meditate for an hour to an hour and a half, that's really great for me. Um, and I'm quite a disciplined person and I don't do that. You know, I would say it goes pretty well for periods, but there are periods where it gets disrupted or I have a call with California at 11 at night and then I don't get up or whatever <laughs> the story is, right? Um, and so I just think that this is something, <clears throat> this, this brings me to an area that, I, you know, I'm interested in like, so what, what kind of collective structures like you know obviously there's the course but what is it have you done any research down like the follow-ups like what is it of people who come out of the protocol who like two years later are still well in fundamental well-being versus people who kind of i don't want to say relapse but you know like given they want to stay in wherever they are or they want to deepen they haven't you know what have you done any work like that or do you if you haven't do you have any conjectures you know and like just put it out there for me i'm like oh I've come to, you know, why do people go to monasteries traditionally? I mean, there's a variety of reasons, but it was like, I'm going to be surrounded by other people who are all practicing in this way. You know, you know, there might be many other reasons in Christian or Buddhist tradition, but that's one. And I'm like, oh, wow, I need to, you know, maybe it's not literally physically, but I need to be around other people who do this because kind of you do what other people do you know if you just said you got to prioritize it you know if you want to get if you think fundamental well-being is important it's like if you wanted to learn to bicycle and you thought it'd be important you'd be around other people who do bicycling a lot <laughs> so i don't know that's i'm putting it out for your thoughts but have you tracked that and have you got any ideas of what you notice supports people in this ongoing their ongoing kind of practice or development in this area yeah yeah sure um and you know one of the things to think about is um Traditionally, when someone would transition into fundamental well-being, ordinarily people are not in a very rich tradition. And what I mean by that is like if you're in like some, you know, Tibetan Buddhist type tradition that has really focused on this from many angles for a very, very long time, and you have access to a lot of good teachers and teachings and stuff like that, um, there are a, there, they really have a good map of the spaces of this that they're interested in. And they've got a lot of methods that can help you get there um, and stuff like that, right? What we see is most people who transition don't go much further, right? And so it's not necessarily that they'll ignore fundamental well-being to the point of falling out of it, though normal people often do. I'm talking about people who have like been familiar with our research in some way. Um, but if you know, fundamentally, the thing to do is to at least put some attention onto the sense of fundamental well-being inside yourself, right? What we call sinking in, as you know, uh, kind of sinking into fundamental well-being. If you just do at least some of that, you know, that is a fantastic stabilizing influence. It's very easy to do. Almost everybody can do it with just casually thinking about it. You don't have to meditate for an hour a day or, or anything like that, right? And so actually people holding themselves in fundamental well-being with that knowledge that you can just sinking in is good enough, um, you know, they're not generally going to slip out unless like, you know, they go through some crazy life stress that maybe pulls them out, which can happen, but it's unusual uh, or whatever. Uh, but what you don't see is progression or deepening uh, or, you know, things like that, right? And so, you know, that hour of meditation at, you know, six in the morning, um, that's not really a stabilize in fundamental well-being kind of action as it is a progress in fundamental well-being kind of action, 
right? And so we just see traditionally in the public, we, way before our information was out there, was people are largely stagnant from a fundamental well-being standpoint. The people that would normally stick in it from a public standpoint were either, they either had life circumstances that supported it or they had a very powerful transition to it that made it stick deeper without them even realizing that they needed to sink into it and stuff like that, you know, just sort of stuck on its own. Um, but then they didn't really change much, you know, over time, over decades, just having fundamental well-being at the core of their being would, you know, recondition things and, you know, things would you know change it would sort of naturally deepen or whatever but it was over the span of years decades that type of thing where and realistically a lot of that could have been done in months um but just sort of you know left to its own natural unfolding process um it'll 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 stay you know reasonably stable in the right circumstances but what you just don't see is progression so we very rarely saw in the early days of the research for instance people who had moved locations you know, people had sort of landed in a location and over the years they had their system had sort of increasingly, you know, psychologically reconditioned, triggers had deconditioned, you know, um, things had changed and they'd moved a little deeper into fundamental well-being. But it wasn't like some significant profound change or something like that. Um, since the, our material has been more widely available to communities like that. Um, and a lot of people have watched it and become aware of it. That's shifted. That's changed, we've noticed, um, in the research. And so uh, now when we run across people, um, they they are often deepening more. They are changing locations more. Um, in the early days, it was, all, it was very rare to find a research subject that had shifted locations. And now it happens all the time to us. You know, they're, they're coming at us every day, really. Um, and so... I would say the the primary thing is the rate of change, the rate of progression, the rate of deepening, also the idea that you can optimize this for your life, you know, could be that you land at location four out of the blue, right? So you're just, again, you can land at any place from one to four. Uh, so you, you're a normal person one minute and boom, and the next minute you're in, you know, location four, probably the first thing you do is start visiting psychotherapists because it seems like something has gone wrong. I'm not kidding. That's not a joke. That's what people do. Uh, the psychotherapists are sort you know, they sort of do a case study and they're like, well, you know, you seem derealized or depersonalized, but we can't give you that clinical diagnosis because you're not suicidal. Like you're not unhappy. It seems like this is kind of, you know, net positive in your life. Your life hasn't seemed to have gotten immediately dysfunctional or anything like that. So uh, we don't really have a diagnosis for you, you know, go away. Uh, all right. And that's the uniform experience of people that had a shift out of the blue into location four. So they're left to more or less figure it out themselves. There's not literature out there. Now there is, our stuff is out there and stuff. But back then, you know, there wasn't literature out there for them to find. They just are sort of struggling and figuring it out on their own. Um, the ideal thing for someone in that type of situation is to come down to an earlier form of fundamental well-being. You know, basically do the opposite of what a spiritual tradition or a religious tradition or whatever you know, might expect. Uh, so maybe try to come down, try to reconstitute emotion, right? So that's why in the book, we put that in there. How do you get out of location four? We made darn sure that we published that. Um, you know, you, you can feel these things that are sort of like parts of emotions that never come together into emotions anymore in location four. Uh, so put your attention on those things, get them to reconstitute themselves back into emotions, get that to pull you either back out of fundamental well-being, which almost never happens, or pull you to an earlier place in fundamental well-being and see if that is a more functional, you know, place for you to live your life from, or, or just a place that you're able to, you know, be more comfortable with psychologically. Oh, thank God, I love my kids again, you know, or whatever the thing is. That, go ahead. And, and just to give it a, a, who would you ever encountered? I mean, obviously you couldn't say who they were, but just you, can you remember one concrete case study of someone who'd just landed in location four out of the the blue for themselves? And what what what, what was you know what was this person doing? Were they was it an ordinary job or were they a spiritual seeker already or? Can you remember one example? Like yeah, there's a lot of examples of that, actually, that we have in our data pool. Um, you know, one of them even, a lot of the, let me think about who I can, who's giving me permission to. Uh, so, because uh, we, you know, the data is anonymous and we have to, we respect that from a research project standpoint and all of that. 
Um, okay, so here's an example of it with someone that I actually know. Uh, he's a really fantastic marketer. He's an internet marketer. And at the time he was, uh, he had sort of a, a multi-million dollar plus business in the self-help space. And he'd realized that the self-help space and the spiritual space had a lot of overlapping motivations and that it was probably really easy to take his existing business infrastructure and map it over into the spiritual marketplace. And so he was just at the, he just had this idea, you know, maybe he ran across the sales page in the spiritual space or something and just realized, oh, wow, those are all the same hot buttons that I'm hitting or who knows what it was, right? I don't remember that part of the story. And so he decided to get some book. He didn't even remember what book it was. He decided to get some, go to the, go to the not the library, but go to the bookstore, get some book off the shelf about spiritual stuff, about enlightenment type stuff and read it. So he gets that book, he reads, you know, a couple of chapters in it, and he wakes up the next morning in location four. All right, that's it. There was nothing more to it than that. It wasn't a meditator, wasn't spiritual, wasn't, he just really randomly went to the bookstore, randomly picked some book off the spiritual new age bookshelf section, right? Uh, was just beginning his marketing familiar, familiarization process, wasn't even looking at it for anything that related to him. He was looking at who are these people, what are their belief systems, you know, looking at it from a marketer's lens, right? Wasn't even personally interested in it. And wakes up the next morning in location four. He's looking across the table at his daughter. And in location four, you can kind of hear your mind still thinking oftentimes when you're first in it. You're not engaged with those thoughts. You're not the thinker. Uh, it's sort of like your metacognitive process. It's kind of watching the thinking going on. And you could see his mind was analyzing, okay, that's my daughter across the table from me. Wow, I feel absolutely nothing emotionally for her. Is that psychologically healthy? That seems like something has gone really wrong here, right? And so he spent three months trying to get emotion back and trying to wind his way out of location four and described the day that that happened to him as one of the greatest and most important days of his entire life. Right. And it wasn't the day that he transitioned into location four. Right. If you were like, I don't know, into Kashmir Shaivism or something. Right. The day you transition into location four would be like the hallmark day of your existence. Right. For him, it was the day he got out of it. He went back to sort of an earlier form of fundamental well-being. He's still in it to this day. Um, but that's an example. You know, one other question I have, maybe we're kind of coming towards the end of this episode. Is, and he didn't know me incidentally at that point. He had no coloring of any of this. Yeah, yeah. So what one question I have is a bit about what we would call, if, if people were familiar, maybe integral terminology, be like growing up versus waking up or cleaning up. So one thing I'm particularly interested in is what the, the classic thing in, in you might call a form of growing up, which is like taking other people's perspective, second person perspective. And the famous examples in developmental psychology are the very basic kinds with like children. You know, I have a very young son who, you know, clearly struggles to put himself in my shoes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, do I want you shouting at two in the seven, seven a.m. in the morning? No. Oh, I want to <laughs> shout. Or, but the classic story with Piaget is I'm going to have a ball that's colored or, you know, red and green, green, red on one side, green on the other. I show you this. If you show it to a young enough child and they can see red and you ask them what I'm seeing and I'm obviously seeing green, they'll, they'll still say red, which is what they're seeing. Now, mm -hmm. almost everyone who grows up around somewhere between probably three or six will get that they I'm seeing green and they're seeing red, you know. However, we're well aware that many adults struggle to do that in like richer circumstances, you know, including ourselves, perhaps at some point, you know, I don't understand what this other political group that I don't agree with, how can they possibly think things like that, you know, we have this difficulty of taking perspective, perspective taking. Um, and often that's considered a hallmark, you know, in the more even traditional literature, Keegan or, you know, um, yeah, the, the kind of developmental space, that kind of perspective taking is a part of you know, healthy ego development. I mm -hmm. guess I'm interested in what is the relationship, if any, between this kind of de deepening into fundamental well-being, which often seems to have this association with less attachment to thoughts or opinions, with that other, what I would often call kind of growing up in, in this integral sense, 
or what you could kind of see is i don't know ego you know, sort of consciousness development in a different distinct different sense of it is there any connection do you find that people who are deep in fundamental well-being are you know less attached to their views and more able to take the perspective of others and as such you know you know this kind <clears> of <throat> development or, or not and i mention this because i think one of the great insights for me out of some of the work around integral and others was that waking up and cleaning up were the same were not the same i could have profound kind of spiritual development and still you know have trigger issues about my father without realizing in fact maybe not realize it even more because most of the time i'm in suchness um so i just kind of this is a different slightly different area but yeah do you do you see that do you do you notice a connection or maybe not a connection between those kind of capacities yeah i you know i did my dissertation um years ago on this question to some degree right <laughs> which is, uh, do you, can you develop your way to fundamental well-being? At the time, there was sort of this belief that if like enough of these developmental lines raised up to a certain point, maybe you would become, you know, in fundamental well-being, or uh, there's an ego development scale that um, someone named Suzanne Cook Greuter uh, doing her doctorate at Harvard under Keegan, who you just mentioned at the time. I've, I've taken Keegan's class when I was at Harvard. Uh, great class, very you know, amazing guy, amazing body of work. Um, the she basically looked at sort of the classic interpretation of ego development and felt like the highest layer of it probably had a lot of other stuff compressed down in it. And she looked through thousands of people's responses in order to sort of extend the scale upward. And when she did that, you had a lot of people um, kind of jumping on that. Um, uh, Ken comments a lot on, you know, Susie's work, Ken Wilbur and Susan Cook-Greuter's work, um, especially back in that, you know, time period and whatnot, where it did look like the extension of her ego development scale started to sound a lot like people in fundamental well-being, uh, if you went high enough, it seemed, right? Uh, and so she was always quite clear that she did not think that that was the case, that these things did not, you know, she didn't, she didn't, she wasn't working with living subjects that were in fundamental well-being, giving them these measures. She was analyzing historical data that had been collected on these measures, which is how she got those, um, that extension of the scale, right? And so, but people obviously notice this and they start saying, you know, well, this sure looks like you can just keep developing your way all the way to fundamental well-being. You know, you keep the moral development going, you keep the whatever development going, and eventually, bing, you know, there's fundamental well-being for it. And she was very clear that she did not think that that was the case, that she saw, she agreed with them that there were these similarities that seemed to appear, but uh, nobody really tested this. And so I tested it. Uh, this, you know, you're looking for something groundbreaking, potentially, when you're doing a dissertation, right? You're trying to add some significant piece to human knowledge and understanding. That's the basically the benchmark for a PhD dissertation. Uh, and so you're looking to do something very significant. I'm like, wow, nobody's tested this. Let's test this. And so we went out and we used that same measure. Uh, Susie referred me to one of her primary scores so that no, no, nobody would look at our work and be like, well, but who knows if, you know, you scored those things correctly. It's like, no, it's, it's like Susie's right? score people, you know? Uh, and so, you know, it was like, you weren't going to come back on the findings. Um, and what we found was that there really wasn't a relationship between fundamental well-being um, and this that was that was evident or that was apparent. Um, you know, there it was a relatively small sample. It was like 30 something people, 32 or 36 or something. That's so many, so much research ago, I can't even remember. Um, but whatever it was, it was like in the 30s uh, in terms of the number of people that took it. And there was a location four person in there. And the location four person was the person that scored the highest, actually. Um, on that. But there's also confounds there because it's also known that there's uh, educational differences. So, you know, people who are more highly educated and often more intelligent are likely to score higher on these developmental measures, as an example. And that person was a PhD level genius scientist 
who had run, you know, hundred million dollar research programs, right? And had thousands of scientists working for him because of his degree of ability to be successful with science and engineering and stuff, right? Um, and so it, you could say like, he was the exemplar in the 36 people, you know, in terms of like, you know, development in general, right? Uh, and so maybe it's not so surprising that he's the guy that topped out that scale, right? It could not be related to, you know, location four that he was in. Uh, it could be just simply that he was like the superhero um, of that group of people, right? So, but generally speaking, there wasn't a correlation. You know, they were all over the place. They were way outside of that section of the scale that was thought to relate to fundamental well-being. There was a skew towards, we found the same skew towards education and stuff like that, that you see. Um, so. Yeah, can, 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 my point is I'm fairly, for myself, I'm fairly convinced that is multidimensional. What I mean is that there's, there, there can be development in, in if you like waking up or, or in fundamental well-being, and there's there's a different axis you know i know we talked about the wilbur coombs or coombs wilbur matrix at one point i think the first maybe briefly in the first episode so i i'm my question is more of like and you're saying that there wasn't at least evidence that of correlation i guess that's my question i'm fairly i think if i'm getting it right the greater would be a bit more of a stacking which is this kind of debate like oh it's like you kind of move off the develop this kind of other developmental scale and that leads i'm more like i can think of it as orthogonal like you can move along the fundamental well-being without you know because you could be a zen you could be a zen master who's racist kind of classic you know you could be morally sure. poorly developed and highly spiritually developed. and in theory that's not in many Absolutely. cases possible you should if you're if you're if you're spiritually developed you and I, I get that i guess my question is more is there any correlation is there any association so i guess my 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 question you know in the crudest sense is are these capacities you could develop for, to put it simply you could develop second person perspective without any being in fundamental or being at all or any waking up and um conversely you maybe potentially could be quite awake or quite deep in fundamental away well-being and not be able to take second person perspective you know in, in you know those could be uncorrelated it would seem unlikely though right it would seem like there's some aspect where moving in some aspects at least of fundamental being would i would say give you capacity it would be a not not necessary um it would not be a sufficient condition but it might be like a necessary or certainly an enabling condition in like greater ability to take perspectives or less emotional attachment to your views and i guess well, that's my my um yeah my, let my, me there's a lot of ways we could skin this, right? And so, like, for instance, one of the things that happens as you deepen into fundamental well-being is um, you increasingly have a silent or a silenced theory of mind, right? So a hallmark of non-fundamental well-being people or normal people, whatever you want to call them, it's maybe not the best word for it, um, non-fundamental well-being people, non-finders, right? Um, is that they spend an enormous amount of time building up theory of mind, right? So my, that would be me in this example, building up a very elaborate theory of who you are, really trying to understand that, right? Uh, the, in many ways, the thing that separates excellent leaders and people who rise in organizations and stuff from people who don't are their ability to, you know, really nail down theory of mind in other people to the point where they can just sort of move them around like little chess pieces to make projects succeed and, you know, whatever else, right? And so theory of mind is a really, really big deal. It's what our system spends a lot of time on. It's the whole social survival system for humans and, you know, all of that. Uh, that really diminishes substantially in fundamental well-being. And as you deepen further and further into fundamental well-being, it just quiets down. And so you you really aren't having, you know, a, a second person perspective or a third person perspective or whatever else on other people, because that's tied into the theory of mind system. And for most people, that's been shut off. Occasionally, you meet a finder that's gone through the pain of re-enabling that and remaining deep in fundamental well-being, but it's extremely rare. Sometimes they've done it as a hobby. Sometimes they've done it just because they're stuck in a certain work environment um, or a certain personal environment. They're living in a shared house and that house is all into this stuff and they're tired of being called a psychopath or something, you know, so they just force their way into that again, uh, or whatever else, right? Um, and so realistically, um, I think probably as someone develops, they're less likely to have that type of self, you know, that type of reflection 
or that type of reflective capability. And you see different systems deal with this in certain ways. You know, you see some Buddha systems, for instance, deal with it by just stressing the cultivation of compassion. Um, you know, because if you can at least program in compassionate behavior towards others, and nobody really thinks about whether or not you're understanding them or, you know, whatever else, right? I mean, you're, it still sort of all works out um, in terms of your interactions with people. In location three, it's less of an issue just because you're so just loving towards everybody and helpful and whatever else. It has nothing to do with who they are. You know, you love the rock as much as you love the person standing in front of you, right? It's There's no different, there's no differentiation in that field of love, right? But to those people, they feel loved and appreciated and seen, and they love being around you as a location three person and, and all of that. But the kind of stuff you're talking about, you know, it's, not necessarily well, there's there. a subtlety, right there's, there's the, the ability for me if i'm living with someone to get like to 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 be like oh what are they going to feel if i like drink the milk in the fridge and there's a mm -hmm. there's a subtlety of that of the ability to be like to put it in the piaget model even like hey i've just shown a model and i need to work out whether the robber can see the cop or whether the teddy bear in this position can see the top of the mountain you know there's an aspect where a lot of a lot of what causes um like attachment to views, if you were to use a Buddhist like type terminology, comes from the ego mind, right? Like it might not be, I'm actually thinking a lot about what the teddy bear can see or metaphorically what my housemate feels about the milk in the fridge. But at least if the housemate brings it up, I can be like, okay, you want me to, you, you, not that I'm thinking about your theory of mine, but you want me to not drink the milk in the fridge. I can, you right. know, and I'm not going like, oh my God, you know, uh, you know, you're accusing me right. of drinking your milk, you know, that, yeah. that aspect yeah. of things has kind of fallen away a lot, right? The kind of defending totally. the ego, I've got right. my, Doesn't my matter. Just don't drink I, the milk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Unless you're trying to get rid of your housemate, you just won't drink the milk, right? Yeah. Like you just won't drink the milk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or like I, or even I can see that like Republicans think this way and Democrats think that way. And I'm maybe not got any dog in the fight, and I'm not thinking about the Democrat. You know, my my sister's Democrat, so what does she think? But there's an ability to maybe take that perspective when needed. Do you see what I mean? Or like, I'm not going sure. to attachment to my perspective. There isn't really. And a that can that can absolutely all be the case. And you can also have finders who are diehard conservatives or diehard liberals. Right. And who get together and fight it out. You know, I remember um, there was there one time I was in the middle of nowhere in the heartland of America somewhere. And it, it just so happened there were two finders in one tiny town in some, you know, flyover type state, as the coast people would call it, right? Kind of a forgotten state in America. Um, and one of them was Republican and one of them was Democrat. And they would get together over dinner and just fight about politics. Right now, neither one of them were like so passionate that they were beating each other over the head. I think they just enjoyed the banter, you know, back and forth. But they both clearly had a perspective, you know, that they were coming from. One of the things that we detected very early on in fundamental well-being people was a dogmatism. Oftentimes, one of the reasons I did not chose to transition until uh, quite a number of years into the project was because I saw that these that there were these biases that formed in people that were in fundamental well-being, and I was concerned that it would affect the data analysis of the project. Um, and so I waited until I felt like that would no longer be an issue, enough other people looking at the data, you know, big enough teams, stuff being done enough, all of that before I transitioned, because I could not predict what kind of bias uh, might develop in myself in whatever way or what sort of belief system. There is this sense of certainty that I, we, we think of it often developing like this, you know, there is a sense of certainty that comes with your experience of reality in an increasing way in fundamental well-being. If you're a finder that doesn't have other finders, or I live my entire life surrounded by finders these days, right? And have for a long time. So I'm weird. I'm a totally unique case. Um, but most people don't. They're like the only finder they know for the most part, right? And so, you know, maybe there's another one across town that they can fight about politics with, right? But generally speaking, lots of them, it's like just them, right? And so imagine you have, imagine you're that marketing guy, right? And you shift into location four, then you come back to wherever location two or wherever you came back to. Um, and then you're living your life. No one around you that you know 
as is experiencing this, right? You do little tests, you talk to your wife about it, you know, she's worried that you're gone, something's gone, a screw loose. Okay, never mention it to your wife again. Uh, you mention it to maybe a friend or two, they look at you like, what's what are you talking about? You're starting to be weird. I never mention it again, right? Maintain those relationships, right? This is how it unfolds, right? In the meantime, what's going on inside you is you realize that you are experiencing a level of truth about reality that is so far beyond what the other people in your experience um, can ever even remotely fathom, uh, what, what do you think happens in the internal system? A bias develops towards this internal feeling of truth, which is an isolated internal feeling of truth, and which can become as extreme as any isolation. I mean, where does extremism come? It often comes from isolation, groups being in isolation, you know, not taking multiple perspectives or recognizing the value of different perspectives and points of views, which you're not at that point. Cause nobody else, you know, everybody is like, wow, something's, you know, something weird is going on with you. Are you okay? Right. And so everything that they're going to say, you're going to look at is kindergarten. Like, yeah, everything's okay. You are like, you know, a pathetic example of humanity or something compared to me, you know, at this point, like I have, I am experiencing these incredible truths of the universe or whatever. And I can't, you're not even developed enough for me to have a conversation with, like, I'm going to believe anything or, you know, any advice that comes out of your mouth about my life or whatever, you know, like that's going to be in any way meaningful or relevant, or I'm going to take that serious ever again. Right. Uh, you're like way down here and I'm way up here now in terms of understanding the greater truth of things and whatever else. Right. And that just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning over periods of time into directions where you get very dogmatic beliefs and tremendous certainty internally. Um, yeah. And so for some people, you know, that they're perspectivist enough prior to that, where it doesn't go in that direction for other people, they're not. And then you have all these different shades of experience um, and, you know, how that can unfold. Someone like me that is, you know, spending their entire day talking to finders at this point, frankly, I mean, I almost never talk to seekers anymore. It's all finders that we're helping with stuff for the most part. I've, you know, the people that run the protocols that help seekers become finders, uh, that's an autonomous thing practically at this point in my world, right? So I almost never speak to a seeker. I'm always just dealing all day. My expertise is useful to finders primarily at this point, right? Right? That's where I have the unique value added. So I spend all my whole day talking to finders. I, you know, I'm forced into multi-perspective thing, and I have been since the very beginning of this. And so I'm fortunate because I don't think I've developed um, that sense of bias or dogma or whatever else. But but the odds of you being that person who's forced into a pluralistic perspective around this stuff is very rare. You're going to adopt your spiritual beliefs of your, you know, your sect, or, yeah. you know, you're going to be in isolation, you're going to spin out in some way there, or whatever else. Well, so I mean, I, I think this is like a moment of real agreement in the sense of what I was saying, actually, at the very beginning of the section was my view, like from well, myself, not saying my personal view, but is it is this multidimensional. And what I think you're really confirming is it isn't. It's like this assumption, like, oh, I'm going to best progress in fundamental being. And that means suddenly, um, you know, that means I've progressed in these other ways. And I guess, you know, I think just give one example that's public and, and it's slightly more about the cleaning up, I feel. But I think it has the same story, which is that you can develop in fundamental well-being, but not realize that you still have a load of triggers or mind stuff going on. Is Kula Dasa has this, you know, public document about what happened, this 35 page document. And it's kind of fascinating for uh, people known Kula Dasa and John Yates, who's, I think pretty much certainly a finder, you know, progressed quite a long way along at least a Buddhist tradition and then had this kind of instant with his his wife, you know, it's kind of public with divorce oh. his wife and stuff. But he wrote this long document and, and uh, about kind of a polygia. But the fascinating point is he's like, wow, at the end, he's like, I really realized despite being in suchness, all this other trigger behavior was getting activated that I was almost unaware of. Um, I think you could see it right. as a mind, you know, maybe you're shifting out of mind to some degree. And you're less aware of what your mind's doing. And that's actually a kind of a risk almost. And he was kind of like, oh, you know, I didn't realize. And he, had, he described he had some trauma as a, a child. And wow, I was, you know, in this, you know, I was actually almost not seeing what I was going on for myself. And I think this point yeah. that. Uh, well, and he was struggling with cancer for many years during well. all of that and everything else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of things. But my point I'm saying is this illustration that maybe our growth or our development or our, our 
uh, our potential maybe it is multi-dimensional there are these you know that you you, you, you it doesn't make you um morally perfect being a finder or vice versa that these kind of more different lines of potential uh growth of ourselves you know morally or you could think of or you know in in, in the locations if you want to think, i'm not sure i don't want to say it's a progress but multiple dimensions you can explore uh i think is what i hear you emphasizing and again because we're going to run on time i think in your your book i just want to say for listeners this is an amazing book by jeffrey the very short the finder's book short uh, to read where even you have examples about you know even ch testing people on implicit racism or other things like <laughs> even like people thinking that they're an amazing yogi that they can do things with their body now because they're in fundamental well-being but if you actually kind of empirically test it then, then that's not true they they have this ability that i can kind of do anything with my body now or something i we're going to run out of time so maybe we'll cover that but i just want to emphasize that i think this is actually a really interesting interesting point and maybe one if we get to do an, at least maybe one other episode i know we could explore is what you see the frontiers are in these kind of areas because i think to finish and you know maybe you could comment very briefly on this we're running on time is one of the things that maybe you then reflect on is that many spiritual traditions have combined both kind of some degree of maps of of maybe uh, fundamental well-being you know i think of some aspect areas of buddhism for example but also with a quite a rich as you said ethical or even practice like you're going to develop compassion you know or you're going to here's this actual ethical structure which in a way is uh, is is kind of like making sure there's some guide rails around this 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 experience which as you say could otherwise be quite untethered um, because it's so powerful it's maybe so isolated from any from people around you and I, I i kind of have myself started think oh there's a logic to why some of spiritual traditions are set up with you know buddha dharma sangha or you know like mul these multiple guide rails of them um yeah are there any i mean it's more of a teaser for if we come to an exhibition but any thoughts on that in the one or two minutes <laughs> we have left <laughs> yeah and beyond that there's a recognition of going further um and many of those traditions will allow you to leave those guide rails behind you know um but generally being removed from the community as a part of that you know i'm not a religious scholar but i've had a lot of you know dinners with religious scholars that were fascinated with our work over the years right and i picked up those little tidbits uh, from them here and there. And I think one of the things that uh, one of the historical Buddhism scholars that I was uh, having dinner with one time, uh, one of the things that he said that I thought was very interesting was that he could see in the historical literature that there was a place where uh, the Buddhists were making it to what we would call location four, and that they just sort of discovered that uh, maybe a bunch of location four people aren't great to live in community with. Um, and, you know, the, and out of that, it comes sort of a new dogma around stopping short of location four at location three, you know, if you want to live in community, which becomes, you know, the bodhisattva idea, I'm not going to wake up fully until all beings are awake or, uh, you know, sort of that type of thing. But he's like, you know, I swear you look back at that and you do it through sort of the lens of what we've learned, you know, from the modern psychology stuff around this and whatnot. And it's sort of like, it just kind of looks like a, okay, how do we figure this living in community thing out <laughs> to be more pleasant than what we've currently got? And yet at the same time, it's like, you can go to the forest, you can go to the cave. There's no restriction on you going further, go further. And we will support you as a unit. Someone will bring you the food, you know, you will have like an assistant uh, to help you with these things, you know, whatever, we're happy to cook and give you things and whatever else. But it's like, now you're out there, you're not in here. You know, you, you know, clear out your meditation cell, you know, we're giving that to the next guy, uh, the caves up there uh, for you. And so it was accommodating a lot of this type of stuff and a lot of this stuff. And you talk to these um, real historian types, you know, um, a lot of this stuff was really, really practical. You know, there's hundreds of these precepts for how to live as a monk and stuff like that. And people have like looked at those from a historical life standpoint, you know, less religious historian, more like practical life period type historian. Um, and it's really interesting, the, you know, where they think the different practicalities of that arise from. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Uh, I hope, again, listeners have enjoyed this episode three in this ongoing dialogue. Uh, absolutely fascinating your work. Um, really, really interesting and also 
great to be able to kind of share the unfolding of it in this it, through the series of how you've explored. Um, is that thank you very much today? I think we're going to come to a, an end, and listeners can tune in if we have a an episode four. We'll be seeing on that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>